Greetings and welcome to another special service by the Princeton Church of Christ. Also, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Our service is designed that we may virtually fellowship and song, prayer, giving, and the Lord's Supper. Afterwards, we'll have an edifying message by our minister, Bruce. So I invite us all to lay aside the cares of the world and focus our heart, our minds, on the Lord. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your glory. Good morning. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Well, Father, we come before you this morning to worship you, to acknowledge you as the God and the ruler of the universe and the creator of all that we know. And Father, we ask you to bless us this morning as we worship you it's electronically because of uh, the uh, disease that's running uh, amok around the world. Please help the doctors and help those who in decision-making uh, roles in our uh, political system make wise decisions that will help us get through this and get back uh, on our feet and back to being able to come together as one body to join in worship of you and in fellowship with one another. Father, bless those who have prepared this worship this morning, who've made it possible for us to come together electronically, who have prepared thoughts around the communion, who have prepared a lesson. Especially, Father, we ask a blessing on Bruce, who will be speaking pre-recorded message because he's been to the hospital and gone through surgery in, the, uh, in this last week. And uh, we just pray that he will continue to recover from that surgery. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. In John chapter two, Jesus's first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding that took place in the town of Galilee. Uh, at the Last Supper, the wine was to be a symbol of the blood that Jesus would shed for us on the cross at Calvary. On two separate occasions, Jesus fed the multitudes, thousands, with bread and fish. And at the Last Supper, the bread was a symbol of his body that he would sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. After his resurrection one morning on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, he was cooking a couple of fish on an open fire with the charcoal wood embers, and the apostles with Peter went back to their trade of fishing, but caught nothing. In John chapter 21, verse 6, Jesus said, Cast a net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. The catch was so large, they were not able to haul it in. Then Jesus said to Peter, it is the Lord. They finally were able to haul in 153 fish without tearing a net. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Come and have breakfast. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. These are the symbols Jesus used that held special meaning that we are to remember him by, the wine and bread, especially during the Last Supper, and the fish after his resurrection, so that the apostles remembered the miracle of the fish they had hauled in when they first met Jesus, and how they must have shared a meal with him at that time. And now Jesus has cooked the fish for them after another miracle that was the same as when they first met him and they shared the same meal together after his resurrection. So in this way, Jesus said to do this in memory of him at the Last Supper. And we do this now by having the bread and wine together to commemorate the request of our Lord. I hope you have prepared a little bread and some red grape juice, cranberry juice, or tomato juice to symbolize the body and blood of Christ as we all share this together. Let's pray. Dear Father, our God in heaven, we thank you that you gave your precious son to atone for our sins because this was something that would be impossible for us to do after we've fallen from the garden. And now you sent your son, your only begotten son, the most precious of all, to come here on earth in the flesh to be with us, to teach us, to heal us, to feed us, and to tell us the truth about our Father in heaven. And we thank you, dear Father God, for allowing your son to become sin for us on that cross. And we know, Father God, we, well, actually we don't know, but we, we can, can imagine the pain that you went through to see your son go through that. And we know, dear Lord Jesus, how you suffered for us. And now we do this, this half of this bread and wine in memory of you, so that we would take the time to think about that Last Supper with the apostles before you were to go to the cross on our behalf. So we do this, dear Lord, in remembrance of you, out of love and respect and reverence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Without this, it would be impossible for us to have a relationship with our Father in heaven. And this gives us the access to our Father because you are our, our high priest, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for all of this work that you've done for us. We thank you that you finished this work and you've conquered death for us. 
And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. We have a few announcements. The right after church service at 11, 10 a.m., we've been having a Zoom fellowship gathering. Everybody that uh, you might want to see at church is going to be there, so we urge you to participate. Uh, the information has been sent out in the email that Phyllis sent to all members and, uh, and participants, regular participants in our church service. Secondly, there is a middle school and a preschool uh, gathering, online gathering of kids uh, that's out there, and it's probably going to be today. If you'd like your child to participate, or if you're a middle schooler and you want to participate, please contact, uh, use the contact information on the email that Phil has sent out to members to find out where to go and who to, uh, who to contact with. Uh, third, we have a Bible study on Tuesday night. John Walker is going to be leading it. It's been uh, regularly on Zoom, uh, and uh, but also it's been on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, contact John Walker if you uh, uh, wish to participate, or in whatever you know form that you're able to uh, to to get on technologically. In addition, there's a, a women's Bible study at 7:45 p.m. On uh, the men's Bible study is at seven. The women's Bible study is at 7:45 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, again, send an email to contact Princeton at PrincetonChurchOfChrist.org if you wish to join in on women's meeting, and uh, you'll uh, uh, get a discussion about receiving credentials. In addition, um, we're, uh, we're we're continuing to do our offering almost entirely online. Uh, which has uh, a lot of you have decided to participate in. Thank you very much. Uh, please go to our website. There is a button at the top on our website, PrincetonChurchOfChrist.org. Up there you'll see a button that says About. When you click on the About button, you'll go down. There'll be another link that says Donate. You can do not have to be a PayPal member to donate. Um, you can just have your credit card, but do it online. You can also still send us a check to the, the Princeton Church of Christ or give one or send one to any one of the elders. But uh, please be aware, uh, the fastest way for a donation to be processed now and the safest way is, is through our PayPal and our online ink link. Um, in addition, if you have any prayer requests, if you have any concerns, if you have uh, anything help that you need, please message contact PrincetonChurchOfChrist.org. Uh, we're gonna be regularly We've been putting out a prayer list regularly. Phyllis has been creating one regularly each week. Uh, we'd like to put your prayers on there. If you have any concerns, please uh, uh, express those concerns uh, through the contact uh, email, and uh, we will pray about them uh, throughout the week. You know, we 
are experiencing a great deal of anxiety and fear. But perhaps one of the most crippling uh, emotional experience uh, has to do with a guilty conscience, which creates a lot of fear and apprehension because we're afraid others are going to find out or that we are truly guilty before God and that there is a judgment day and that can create a great deal of fear and anxiety. Uh, am I prepared? Uh, what will happen to me? The good news of the gospel is that God's love wins out over this kind of fear. But you know, the great problem is that we, we don't have the right kind of fear. and We don't fear the correct things. We're fearing all the wrong kinds of things. The book of Proverbs starts off and introduces God's wisdom by saying in verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so, if we want to be wise, uh, then we have to realize that the beginning of that is the fear of the Lord. You see, God's word is not just any kind of word. It's a word from God, the creator God, the God who made us, the God to whom we eventually will be accountable at the end of days. And so consequently, uh, we should start off, it's just the beginning. It's not the end of the journey, but at least the beginning of the journey needs to start out with some appropriate fear the fear of the Lord, so that we listen attentively to the wisdom he has to impart to us, so that we can wisely live our lives, so that we can know why we're here, uh, where we're going, and what it's all about. Otherwise, we're simply making stuff up as we go along, and ultimately, uh, at the end of days, this will be no way to chosen to live. But of course, fools despise any kind of instruction. They already know it all. They don't know anything, but they already know it all. Uh, this is the great human fallacy. But in Luke uh, chapter 12, he reminds us that there are things that we should fear and again, Jesus, uh, chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 4 through 5. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So if you want to be fearful, there is an appropriate personality and issue uh, to be fearful about, especially if you're ignoring his instruction, especially if you don't have a right relationship with God. So instead of fearing death, fearing disease, fearing what other people think about us, we need to be more concerned about how God thinks about us, whether we have a real relationship with the living God or not. You see, there are two certainties in life. One of those is death. We are all terminal. It's not a matter of whether we are terminal or not. It's just a matter of when and where and why. But we're all going to die. And then another certainty is the judgment that we all have to stand before God. And so in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, Paul speaks about this, words that I think 
you'll find insightful. Second Corinthians 5, verse to begin with 1 to 5. But we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heaven. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. I think about what Paul's saying. Uh, he's saying that we are now existing in a tent environment. I think he's referring to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the first worship place of the people of Israel. They constructed in the wilderness. Something you could set up, you could use, you could pack it up and move on. One until many, many years later, a permanent building temple was built in Jerusalem in the days of Solomon. And so he's using that analogy, especially because Jesus uh, said in the Gospel of John that he has come to tabernacle among us. And so he recognized he lived in a temporary dwelling, the dwelling of God. And hopefully you are living in the dwelling of God. If the Spirit of God lives in you. That's the guarantee that you are God's own child, and therefore your tent is full of glory. And so he says, you know, we're going to have strains and stresses and difficulties. Literally, we're going to groan with the trials and tribulations we experience in this tent body. But we have to remember that the ultimate goal of God is not to take the tent away and leave us naked, unclothed, but instead to clothe us with something more permanent, the eternal dwelling place that he has prepared for us so that our mortality might be literally swallowed up by life, life eternal. So while we live, we're in a, in a temporary uh, body will receive an eternal body, a resurrection body to come. But meanwhile, the Spirit is living in us, giving us great hope and purpose and confidence. So Paul continues, verse 6 of chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, all the way through verse 10. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. But we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So Paul recognizes that there's going to be an ultimate judgment. But the good news of the judgment is we find out our brother, the one who sacrificed himself for us, is the judge. Our brother who loves us is sitting on the judgment seat the one who has forgiven us. And so consequently, he says, you know, I'm of good courage. You know, whether I live or die, things are going to be good because my brother Jesus is on the throne. And so since that's the case, I need to have a simple goal. I don't need to be a people pleaser. Uh, I need to be a pleaser of God, a pleaser of Christ. I need to know his will and live within it. 
And so Paul is confident and wants those in Corinth to share the same confidence. Yes, we live in temporary bodies. Yes, we will probably die if Jesus doesn't come back first, but God has a permanent dwelling already made. Now, how do we know that? Because we live by faith, not by sight. Now, faith is not the total absence of reason. Uh, it is reasonable trust. But there are many things in life that we believe in that we can't see. Uh, and so it is with our ultimate hope in Christ. We believe he's reigning and on the throne, the same throne from which he will judge the world, and that he is our brother and our Lord. So Paul said, you know, living, that's good. Living for Christ, filled with the Spirit. Death, death has no fear. I can be courageous as I live. And then in 1 John chapter 4, there are some practical words I think we need to hear. 1 John 4, verse 17 and 18. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So what is he saying? He's saying, if we really understand God, and we're in a right relationship with God through Christ, we have nothing to fear. Instead, we can be confident, even confident, if we know we are going to stand in judgment before God. Why? Because we believe that the judge is also our justifier. He is the one that has forgiven us. He is the one that has paid the price so that we could be redeemed. And if we believe that, then even when we look to the future, not only to death, but beyond death, to the judgment, we don't have to fear punishment. You know, punishment is what comes to people who have been rebels, people that refuse to repent, people that are only going to do it their way, uh, that are not willing to submit themselves to God, who don't believe they need any help. They don't believe they need to change. They don't believe they need the hope of Christ. These people, if they choose that lifestyle, have something worth fearing because they will have to give an account for their foolish choices and how they have wasted their lives. But mature love gives us great confidence. You know, as a, as a young Christian uh, many years ago, uh, I had apprehensions and, you know, I realized that I wanted to be like Christ, but I wasn't as much like Christ at all as I wanted to be. But the good news is over time, Gradually, a little bit at a time, Christ changes us and changes us more into his likeness. But no matter where we are in the process of transformation, we are his children. We are his brothers. And therefore, we have nothing to fear from the judgment. But instead, we have great confidence. If you can be confident in the face of death and the judgment of God, nothing can drive you to fear. I pray that you will not be a person motivated by a guilty conscience, but you will allow Christ 
to forgive and to fill you with forgiveness, hope, and life. Romans 8, verse 14 through 16 says it uh, quite well. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we are not controlled by fear. We are not slaves uh, to our passions and our fears. We have been set free by Christ, and the agent of transformation lives within us, the Spirit himself. <clears throat> and we recognize that we have been adopted as children of God. And therefore, if we allow that same spirit to lead us, <clears throat> he'll lead us away from fear and into life. Because think of what it means to be a child of God. We are going to be heirs of God, which means... Everything that God has will be ours. The Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. This will all be ours. Ours together as God's children. And we're, of course, fellow heirs with Christ. He's our brother. Provided we are willing to live out our life, which requires some suffering. Anything worth having is worth suffering for. But if we suffer, we also know we look forward to glorification. Jesus suffered on the cross, but was glorified in his resurrection. We have the same hope too. That's the Jesus hope. The Jesus hope is not that we won't suffer in this life. Uh, the Jesus hope is that even though we suffer, there is meaning in our suffering because the other side of suffering is life eternal life in Christ. So I just pray that you'll not be controlled by a guilty conscience, that you'll not be apprehensive about the judgment day, but instead will be full of faith and hope and love, which is what Christ came to give us. And so, I pray that is a reality for your life. Will you pray with me? Gracious Father, our God and our Savior, we thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins, for the presence of your Spirit in our lives to give us hope and to empower us to live life to the full. I pray, Father, that you will give us that confidence that comes from your Spirit that comes from your love as we look to the future when we will stand before you, knowing that we can stand before you not as proud, uh, self-righteous souls, but as humble, grateful people, knowing you have loved us, knowing that you have paid the price for us, and that through you we have eternal life. And for that we are forever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.
children of the heavenly king, the children of the heavenly king, may speak their joys of joys and speak their children joys abroad. We're marching on to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown, we're marching through Emmanuel's crown. To fair worlds on high, to fair to fair worlds all on high. We're marching on to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're marching on to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion.